Uh, then my family had the opportunity to meet with the Manchester Church uh, in Wales. Thank you for your prayers. I am here. We have survived driving on the proper side of the road. I have discovered that roundabouts are satanic. <laughs> but I did survive them somehow, some way. Uh, Manchester Church sends their love to you. And it really is incredible, the fellowship that we have, that you can spend just 24 hours with a group of people. And if we open wide our hearts to one another, uh, you can get to know them very quickly. So continue to pray for them. I'm also thankful uh, for all of you that served and came together last Sunday with the singers, with Ali, uh, telling us about the treasure that we have in the kingdom of heaven. And that's so true. The kingdom of heaven is a treasure. It's well worth giving up everything we have to obtain it. And then, even more so, if we've had it for a while and we buried it, we need to remember where we buried it. All right? We need to go back and get it and realize it's highly valuable. It's the most valuable thing to keep in our lives, the treasure of the kingdom of heaven. I was reminded of that uh, so many ways this week, but uh, the men were able to get together on Wednesday night such an honor to have those men come over to my house and for us to spend time together. And I hope our sisters are encouraged that the men this month, we have formed triads for the month. And uh, those triads are going to try and pray together every day and talk about the things that we are grateful for every day. And so I'm, I'm thankful that the brothers are encouraged to do that. And... Uh, we are working to build deeper relationships, even though many of us have been together a long time. Uh, but we want to take our relationships to the next level. So be praying for us as we pray for everyone else uh, and spend time together. And just for me, uh, they were randomly picked, but uh, I was placed with Bob and Ben. Uh, so it's good to spend time with those men and talk to them and just even a few days get to know them better. Get to know them day to day what's on their heart. And I, I, I do want to thank the church. Uh, we've been here over seven months now. And we do sincerely thank you for opening wide your hearts to us. We do feel that. Uh, and the time we spend with you, the way you love our children, your patience with us, your grace for us, your mercy. Uh, just spending time with people, with the men I mentioned uh, Amy and I were spending time with uh, James and Helen on Friday, having coffee together, and just, it, it's good when we open our lives to one another. Amen. And sometimes we take that for granted, but we're thankful for those times. We're thankful for the time that we had on Friday with the shoe marks and with the men on Wednesday night and the prayers on the phone calls and just, uh, my daughter Ella had her birthday, but it just keeps on coming because so many people love her. And many of you want to encourage her. Amen. And that softens our hearts. Amen. We're very thankful for that. It's the kingdom of heaven. Amen. It's a treasure. And to remind us, this is what we've been studying out, and even better, living out, uh, since mid-November. The kingdom comes to Edinburgh. Remember what the kingdom is. It is the majestic reign of God. It's, it, it really can be boiled down to a place. It's huge. It's not the church. Think much bigger than the church. Amen. If we're living out the kingdom of heaven, then our church in Edinburgh is just a colony of the kingdom of heaven. It is a glimpse of greater things to come. And so that's the kingdom of heaven. It comes in waves. And I hope you're praying individually for the church, for your family, that a new wave of the kingdom will come into your life. And as citizens of the kingdom, Jesus says you are salt. When you live out the Beatitudes, the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, when you strap on the hiking boots, you are the salt of Edinburgh. You must get out of the salt shaker, though, and spread that salt around and bring it to this city. When we wear our hiking boots every day in every situation, when we are the salt of Edinburgh, when we are countercultural, when in doubt, do the opposite of what modern religion does. When we are countercultural, yeah. 
When we do the opposite of what people think Christianity is, when we live out the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus then will lift us above the mediocrity of this world. Amen. That's what happens. All heaven breaks loose in your life. We know what happens when all hell breaks loose in our lives, but we want all heaven to break loose Amen. in our lives. What we studied out two weeks ago, and this is the foreword to the sermon, uh, Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the Old Testament. We now view the Old Testament through the eyes of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So as we begin reading today, don't make the mistake of thinking that Jesus came to correct the Old Testament. He is the living Word of God. What He came to do for us, and His Word still lives in our lives today, what He came to do is correct man's perversion of the Old Testament. So today, Jesus dives into the first of six vivid examples that will contrast dead, rule-keeping religion and authentic relational Christianity. Amen. Let me say this again. Jesus is about to give six vivid examples. We're going to hit on the first one today, but he will contrast dead, superficial, rule-keeping religion, and he will contrast that against authentic, life-giving, relational Christianity. Amen. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5. And you perhaps have heard me refer to this world, this word before. Uh, it, it's one of those hipster words, ethos. Ethos. I, I've talked about the ethos of the kingdom of heaven. And Starbucks is smart, right? Uh, they're out to make money. In the States, the water that they sell, the bottled water at Starbucks, it's called ethos. Because it's hipster and it makes you feel like you're really, you're helping the world somehow. You're doing something that's organic and cool and out of the ordinary and they're making a lot of money from that. But this word ethos, it's a word. It means the spirit of something. It's the atmosphere, it's the character of something, it's the prevailing tendency. It's very hard to pin down this word because it, it's just the essence of something. It's an animating principle, a motivating force. It's a code, so to speak, of ethical behavior that governs the decisions you make. You can't always put a finger on ethos, but it's just there. You, you can feel it. It's in your heart. It, it's a character. You know, we talked about this a few weeks ago, the Old Testament and the New Testament. You ever wonder why the New Testament is so much shorter than the Old Testament? You, you look at it, you put your finger in there, the, the New Testament's like this, the Old Testament's like, whoa, this is big. Well, with kingdom living, <clears throat> You don't need specific laws for everything. Mm -hmm. This is very important for us to get. Because we can argue about these things. We can major in the minors. Yeah. That's what Jesus brought with his fulfillment. Is with the kingdom of God. When it, when it comes, and it did come with Jesus, yeah. you don't need specific laws for everything. Here's what I'm talking about. All right. Smoking pot. Is it legal here? No. It smells like it is a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> Around the meadows. Right after school, it's out. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know what it smells. All right. Anyway. Smoking pot. Okay. It becomes legal here. Okay. We can have these discussions. Dude, well, it's legal now. Uh, I don't need a scripture to tell you that smoking weed uh, is, is the way of the kingdom or it's not the way of the kingdom. Right. I don't need a scripture for that. 
If we know the ethos of the kingdom of heaven. There's so many details and things we could talk about. I'm going to hit on one. The women's role in the church. Oh. Oh. 2,000 years of scholarship on this. <laughs> Very smart minds have studied this out. And it's still great. Yes. You know, we have smart people analyzing Paul's writings on this, and sometimes they seem duplicitous. He says one thing here, he says something else. What is he talking about? It's still very great. There's no clear-cut answer for every scenario and every culture and every church. But we can spend a lot of time on that, trying to figure that one out, in every setting of public worship. But there is a kingdom ethos. That Jesus brought where he elevates the woman and honors the woman. There's an ethos of the empowerment of women. Mind you, that goes hand in hand with the God-given role of authority of a man. So we empower, they don't take the power. All right, there's a balance there. But see, that's, that's all great. We don't have the details on that one. But that's the ethos of the kingdom. Christian dating and purity. All right, I, I don't have a scripture on that one. Specifically, I'm sorry. Singles, those advising singles, for my children. I think. But we do have an ethos. So we don't have a scripture on dating because back in the day, the marriages were arranged yeah. And by the way, they generally worked better. <laughs> Let's bring that one into the church. Yeah. I know a lot of parents would like that. Yeah. <laughs> but if you understand the ethos of the kingdom, you will have interactions with the opposite sex in a way that's pleasing to God. Yeah. It will make sense to you. The advice people give you. You'll be able to filter that. You'll be able to take that. And it'll make sense to you. I mean, I, I can't give you a specific New Testament law that... I can't give you a law that forbids a single man, a single woman from being alone at night for many hours in the man's bedroom. But you don't need to know the Greek word for purity to understand that's not the kingdom ethos. Right? Are you with me? That's what Jesus brought. We need to embrace that. It's great, but we need to embrace that. Amen. He gave us His Holy Spirit because He trusts us to work this out. So, with good intentions, we could make an Edinburgh rule book for the church. And we could cover many scenarios that come up. Trust me, this has been tried. <laughs> it's been tried in our family and churches it's been tried throughout church history but where would that lead us we would begin to out Pharisee the Pharisees but we don't learn we would rip the heart right out of the commands we lose the ethos of the kingdom and this is more ingrained in our thinking than you may think. But see, Jesus addressed, he addresses many specifics in this sermon in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But there are many, many issues he does not address. But kingdom ethos, this must govern everything you do in life. For Jesus, motives That means relationships are more important than rule keeping. I'm not saying obedience is not important, but relationships are greater than obedience in the kingdom of heaven. You see, if you get relationships right, you get everything right. Remember, all the law and the prophets are summed up in this command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So relationships matter more than rule keeping in the kingdom of heaven. So this means we not only 
obey God's word, it's even more radical. We're called to obey the heart of God's word. And I tell you what, I mean, there are many, many religions out there. This is what places Christianity in a different league than all the other religions with moral codes. Mm -hmm. Because we're called to not only obey God's word, but we're called to obey the heart of God's word. Kingdom ethos. Keep this in mind. We're going to read here Matthew 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you're offering your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your opponent. While you are going with them to court, lest your opponent hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you're put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Kingdom ethos. You've heard it said, but I say to you. Dead, rule-keeping religion, authentic relational Christianity. Amen. So in verse 21, we have the sixth of ten commandments. Number six, do not murder. <laughs> and, and we know this one. You don't have to be a Christian to figure this one out. If you murder someone, you can't expect to go to trial. And if there is evidence to convict, you will be punished. Verse 22, Jesus then sends us to our knees because he gives us the heart of that command. He sends us to our knees. The Old Testament law condemns murder, but I tell you, personal insults and anger with your brother will send you to hell too. Have you ever wished someone were dead? Or have you ever wished, as I have, could they just go away? <laughs> could this person be out of my life? Could they move away? Could they disappear from my life? And if you thought that, then your heart has known murder. And no human court is competent to, to put you on trial for these things. But God is and He will. God takes insults seriously. I mean, it's no coincidence, one of the last sins committed against Jesus, He's on the cross. And people that He knew personally were hurling insults at Him. Mocking Him. As he suffered. So the principle, the ethos of the sixth commandment is this. Not that we stop short of killing someone. But that we never allow our thoughts to wish them dead. Yeah. Murder is a horrific act. Mm. Taking someone's life. But malicious anger and insult... These are terrible crimes in the eyes of God. In verse 22, Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother. Now it's likely when he says brother, and that means brother or sister. When he says brother here, he's talking about a fellow disciple. That means this anger is personal. 
It's someone you know. It's personal. So, tempting, tempting, tempting. Don't become legalistic here with this word. So, this law only applies to my blood relatives. Or, so this law only applies to people around me in the church. What happens? We start to out-Pharisee the Pharisees. We're picking, we love to do this. I'm not saying don't learn the Greek of things and don't read many churches. I mean, like, study your Bible, get into it, get deep. But beware, don't start out Pharisee the Pharisees. Some of these things are just simple. Yeah. It's just relational. It's treating people how you would want to be treated. So don't out Pharisee the Pharisees. As we read through the Sermon on the Mount, watch yourself. You know, you can go to a place where you say, well, he didn't say anything about this there, so I guess there's not a rule against that. Or, well, he said if someone sues you, he didn't say I couldn't sue someone else. <laughs> or, we'll get to this later, well, don't judge. He says don't judge, so no one needs to be correcting me. Or as we'll study next week, he says lust is like adultery. So you know what? Alright, I have grounds to divorce my husband. Legal grounds. Maybe you do, but you're out Pharisee the Pharisee. By jumping to that. So we don't want to fall in this trap, the legalism trap. Jesus for us is defining true righteousness. And that has everything to do with relationships. So the Pharisee righteousness, which Jesus told us we must exceed to make it in the kingdom of heaven. We must not get obsessed with minor details. Not that they're not important and we don't study things out, some of the scenarios I mentioned at the beginning of my lesson, but we can become way too ruffled about these things. We get obsessed with them, and in this case, when we, we can pick out this word brother, and what does it mean brother or sister or someone close to you? Well, Jesus is going to cover that. You get down to verses 44 through 47, he says this applies, this principle applies to people in general, including your enemies. So the goal as we read this, the goal as we study this, it's not to find a new law. It's to find a deeper principle. It's ethos. It, we we want to find out what reflects God's will in kingdom living. That's where we're going with this. This is what Jesus wants for us. So in the kingdom of heaven, motives matter. Relationships are much more important than rule keeping. This is radical. So to summarize verses 21 and 22, the Old Testament law condemns murder. But I tell you, personal insults and anger could send you to hell too. That's when we go back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, get on our knees, and humbly ask for God's supernatural intervention to make us whole. Yeah. Yeah. So, verses 21 and 22, Jesus gives the heart and the true meaning of the law. He corrects the perversion that man had put in there. So what does this look like? What does this look like in action? Let's read verses 23 and 24 again. So, Jesus says, so if you're offering your gift to the altar, and there you remember. You get there, you're about to do something for God, but then you remember, oh, I'm insulted, I'm angered. You remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So what Jesus does, yeah, he gives us two many parables to illustrate what this looks like. And what it does is it shows us what reconciliation looks like. The goal is for two people to come back together in love. Get rid of that anger, the insults that have infected the relationship like a disease. 
And this is a, a wild example that Jesus used. I just want to remind you that if you see what Herod's temple looked like, and what the people would have heard as Jesus taught this, so you have this conflict, right? And Jesus uses this exaggerated, crazy example to get the attention of his audience that this is very important. So, you know, a Jewish man living in Galilee would have traveled 80 miles, three days. Would have traveled three days to get to Jerusalem to get in the temple, right? To make this offering at the temple. So then the average Jew would come in and you'd have to wade through the court of the Gentiles. All right, there were, there were a series of steps. If, if you've ever been to an amusement park and you get to the most popular ride, just when you think you're there uh, and you've moved up in the queue and you're next, then there's another room you've got to go through <laughs> with another series of lines or queues. So that's what this was. So you'd go in the court of the Gentiles, then you'd have to purchase an animal that would be fitting for your sacrifice, and if you were coming from out of town, then you had to have the right currency, so you'd have to go to the money changers and, and get the right money so you could buy your sacrifice, then you had to go to the court of women, then you get to the court of Israel, queue after queue after queue, the crowds are massive because it's usually a celebration, a festival time, it's like being outside of a huge football match, the Six Nations rugby, and people are all over the place. Hours. Hours. And then you finally get to the priests, and then they perform all their rituals. And you're finally there. You're at the altar to present your sacrifice. You're carrying the heavy animal around. And I mean, this is, this is hard. Watch it after the kids. But at, a, at that exact moment, you get to where it's your turn, and then the man remembers that he's insulted or angered his brother. He has conflict with his brother. He drops everything. He runs out of the temple. He takes the three-day journey back to reconcile with his brother. So this man humiliates himself to make things right. So you see it there? You see that. You, you, you see true Christianity, relationships are greater than and sacrifice, rule-keeping, and obedience. It's a slippery slope. Ethos. What's the point of the story? Settle matters quickly. This is the ethos of the kingdom of heaven. Settle matters quickly. We must take decisive action as far as it depends on you to restore relationships. Obedience. Quiet times. Attendance at church services. All exercises in futility. If you refuse to do your part in your relationships with others. Picture. That's what it is. Jesus, I want to make it, he's not talking about imagined defenses or, you know, I think you need to really be led by the Holy Spirit on this one. Or paranoia, it's not that, but you know, the Holy Spirit reminds you that you've unloaded anger on someone or you've insulted someone and they felt that effect. And maybe it was years ago, maybe it was last week, I don't know. But the Holy Spirit must tell you that. And you need to listen to that. As far as it depends on you, Jesus demands decisive action to restore relationships. Now if you compare this to how the way the world works, this is radical. It's too bad Christians don't live this way. Right? We're usually the ones, at least in the public eye, who are drawing the lines. And we're the ones to always say, we say more about what we're against rather than what we're for. Be the most important thing. So let's read verses 25 and 26. We'll close there. 
This is heavy stuff. <laughs> I have to tell you, I mean, it's inevitable. Uh, the topic that comes up that we talk about on Sunday is the one that I get completely tempted with that week. Just ambushed. You know, it, it really is. I've been on my knees about this the last few days. It's just, it's, it, this is, I'm with you on this. We need God's grace to do this, but it can be done. We've been given the Holy Spirit. God is with us. Verse 25, come to terms quickly with your opponent while you are going with him to court. Lest your opponent hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you pay the last penny. So you will be punished. Is the moral of this story. Right? This is a scenario. This is another mini parable to get our attention. But this time, it's very clear, this is your enemy. This is an adversary. This is your neighbor. This is your teacher at school. This is your bill collector. This is a mobile phone company. This is a politician or a political party. That's who this is. You name it, your classmate. Jesus makes the same point with them here. Do not allow bad relationships to go unresolved. Don't do it. Don't allow bad relationships to remain unsolved. And you know if you try to live this out, it's much easier said than done. This is painful territory. But as far as it depends on you, settle matters quickly. You cannot control the response of the other person. But the point still remains. You settle matters <coughs> quickly. Yeah. The choice is yours. That's your choice. But the kingdom of heaven is built on righteous relationships. The choice is yours. You can leave the church. You can stay in the church and live in misery. Or you can settle matters quickly and rejoice that you're in the kingdom of heaven with your brothers and sisters. Amen. And I know many of you have known each other a long time. I don't want to pull stuff out that's not there. All right? If you, if you go looking for the bad, eventually you'll find it, right? But, uh, but you have to have the Holy Spirit work on you on this one. Is there anything you swept under the rug? Maybe it's someone that's not here. Maybe it's someone that's here. But you have to answer to God for that. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage you to wear the hiking boots of moral bankruptcy mm -hmm. and go to your brother and sister and settle matters quickly. Mm -hmm. And if, if you as an adult have not yet been baptized into Christ, mm -hmm. then there's tension between you and God. Mm -hmm. Settle matters quickly. Mm -hmm. Settle matters quickly. Take the first step today. Humble yourself. I appeal to you. Settle matters quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the ethos of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. It will drive us to our knees. The ethos of the kingdom, it's all about relationships, and it's to settle matters quickly. May God and His grace give us the supernatural power to live the kingdom life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we need your help. This is a hard teaching.